In the year 2010, in the city of Miami, Florida, a relationship between Erica Freeman and Pedro Bravo began during their sophomore years of high school. The two stayed together until they both reached their senior year. Erica then decided that she and Pedro were not a great fit, so she told him that she would like to break off the relationship. Pedro's reaction was not a positive one. He would throw temper tantrums and claim that the two were meant to be together. These so-called temper tantrums quickly escalated into insults and threats. He would insist that the two were soulmates and destined to be together, and that horrible things may happen if she went through with the breakup. As the summer of 2012 approached, Erica was preparing herself for college. She decided to say her final goodbyes to Pedro and completely cut off any communication between the two. During the months following the breakup, Erica started a new relationship with another young man from Miami named Christian Aguilar. Christian and Erica began the relationship when the two went on to attend two different schools six miles apart in Gainesville. Erica was at Santa Fe College and Christian was at the University of Florida. As it turns out, Christian was actually a fairly close friend of Pedro. So Christian and Erica decided to keep their new relationship a secret from Pedro. Within the weeks following Erica's move to Gainesville, Pedro spiraled into depression. He would attempt to message and call Erica, only to have the majority of his messages and calls ignored or declined. He eventually came up with a plan. The first part of his plan was to also move out to Gainesville and to attend the Santa Fe College as well. So that's exactly what he did. Pedro arrived on campus a couple weeks after the vast majority of other students. Both Erica and Christian felt that this choice was a bit bizarre. So they decided to maintain their distance from Pedro and continue to keep the relationship undercover. Unfortunately, Pedro already had information passed on to him from mutual friends regarding the relationship between the two. Whenever Pedro would reach out and ask Erica if she had already moved on to a new boyfriend, Erica would say that she hadn't as she was worried about what he might do. On September 20th, 2012, Pedro then decided to contact Christian directly and ask him if he would like to go shopping together. Although hesitant and weirded out by the idea, Christian reluctantly agreed. At around 5 p.m. on September 20th, the two can be seen entering a Best Buy together, walking throughout the aisles and browsing through CDs. They can then be seen leaving the plaza and driving away in Pedro's vehicle. This is the last moment that Christian Aguilar was seen alive. During the evening of September 20th, Erica became very concerned about Christian's well-being, as he was no longer replying to texts, and each call was being forwarded directly to his voicemail. She tried again the next morning. Again, no response. Erica then decided to call Pedro, as she was well aware that the two were out together the day before. When Pedro answered, he explained to Erica that after the two left the Best Buy, they had gone for a short drive to talk. He stated that during this drive, Christian admitted to everything regarding his relationship with Erica, and an argument took place. Pedro then stated that he dropped Christian off at his dorm following this argument. A few hours later, in the early afternoon of September 21st, 2012, Pedro contacts the resident advisor of Christian's dorm to report Christian missing. My name is Pedro Bravo. Are you a student here? Uh, no, I'm a student at Seventh Day. I don't know where he is right now. So he's not answering it, so I'll need Okay. Following this call, Erica contacted Pedro again and asked him to visit the police department with her. As Erica and Pedro arrived at the station, Christian's father contacted the police as well. My name is Carlos Aguilar, and um, I'm the, the parent of Christian Aguilar. He's a student over at the university. His girlfriend has been trying to contact him since yesterday, and he's not answering. He normally responds to his girlfriend right away, and if he's so concerned about it, we are concerned right now. This is not his normal behavior, and I'm wondering if you guys can help us. Where was he last seen? Uh, the last time that I spoke to him was at 3.42 p.m. Yesterday, he sent me a text message saying that, you know, uh, that he did something for me, and, and that's it. Um, that's the last time that I that I heard from him. One of his friends are here right now reporting also. Her name is Erica, the one that is there? No, this is a male, a, a male friend of his. Pedro was then interviewed regarding the events of the previous evening. Pedro's initial story was the same as what he told Erica. He stated that after picking up Christian, the two hung out for a few hours. They first stopped to get Christian his flu shot. Then they stopped at Zaxby's to get chicken. They then went to Best Buy to buy a CD. 
and then went for a short drive while the two talked. The conversation turned into an argument, and Christian asked for Pedro to drop him off at home. So that's what he did. If he is missing and he doesn't come back, I would really like someone to talk to, to at least find a way to get through this or find a way to get over this. Someone doesn't just vanish for this long and doesn't show any sign of, like, being somewhere. At this point, something's happened. We got in the car and then we drove around because I, I like driving around and talking to someone. I told them, uh, things have just been really rough. I said, you don't understand what I'm going through. And he's like, I think I understand what I'm going through. And I got really frustrated. I don't think you understand because this isn't, uh, like, your little love game with that girl. So you just pulled a car over to the side of the road? Pretty much. And you don't remember what was nearby there? Not really. Pedro's story would change several times. The first change, which was just mentioned, is that Pedro did not actually drop Christian off at his dorm. Instead, he just dropped him off somewhere random at the end of the argument. The next change to Pedro's story was that instead of it being only Pedro and Christian in the car, there was actually another random man. A friendly looking hitchhiker with a gray and blonde beard wearing a cowboy hat. At that point, we saw a, a hitchhiker, just a, a random guy. He had like a, a big white beard. He said he came all the way from New York State to get married with this girl here in Gainesville. But he caught her cheating. Like he, he once he saw her, he said he, I caught her in her panties with beer and this guy. Pedro then added more details to the story again, stating that shortly after letting the hitchhiker out of the vehicle, Christian confessed to Pedro regarding his relationship with Erica. Pedro then punched Christian in the face and demanded that Christian get out of the vehicle. Christian did so and was left in the middle of nowhere. The thing I wanted to tell you because I, I, I like it's gonna, if I don't tell you, it's just gonna eat me up inside and at one point it's just gonna come back and bite me in the ass, I guess. I stopped the car myself and I turned around and I just punched him in the face. And like, I looked at him and I'm like, get out. And he's like, fine. And he opened the door to the side of the car and just got out. <sighs> Pedro. What really happened to Chris? We know that he's not coming back, okay? I know he's not coming back. You know you know he's not coming back. You need to tell the truth. I've been doing this for too long. You know you know he's not coming back. We can help you a little bit as far as if you can explain things. Well, I still be able to go home with my parents tonight if I I'm not gonna lie to you and tell you that you can go home tonight, okay? Mm -hmm. You, 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 you know, it's, it's something that we got to work on. Officers found Pedro to be quite suspicious, so they obtained a warrant for Pedro's phone, vehicle, and apartment. Searching through Pedro's vehicle, they found Christian's blood and vomit on the floor and seat, an empty water bottle with residue that came back to match sleeping pills, and a trace amount of lime rock, a spade-tipped shovel covered in dried mud. Inside his apartment, they found Christian's backpack stuffed inside a luggage hidden inside a closet. These findings led officers to believe that Pedro likely poisoned Christian with the sleeping pills, murdered him, and then buried his body somewhere out in the woods. Pedro's phone told a similar story. Throughout the evening of September 20th, Pedro had been turning airplane mode on and off, likely attempting to create an alibi and manipulate the towers that his cell phone pinged off of. When the forensics team did an even deeper dive into his phone usage that evening, they were able to determine that Pedro had used his flashlight nine times for a total of 49 minutes. After making these discoveries, they questioned Pedro once again. I see him, I show him, punch him once and then hold him. He's strike. Mm -hmm. One time? One time is bad. Okay. So he's striking one hand on his hand. Mm -hmm. Blood? No blood. He was already bleeding. Striking one the other hand, right? Yes. Side of the cheek. How did he get turned around? Where did he get turned around? Pedro was held in police custody following this interview as his story changed once again. Pedro had now stated that when he punched Christian in the face, he had actually knocked him unconscious and then dragged his body out of the car onto the side of the road. Over the following days, investigators asked Pedro to direct them to the locations that he and Christian drove during the evening of the 20th. They also asked him to point out the specific location that he dragged Christian out of his vehicle. Still, 
there was absolutely no sign of Christian. On September 24, 2012, Pedro was officially charged with depriving a victim of medical care. Pedro remained in police custody while officers continued their search. And police believe there's enough evidence to charge Aguilar's friend with murder. Haley Winslow joins us live from Gainesville where we're learning more about the suspect tonight. And only on four, Haley spoke with Bravo's roommate. Haley? Ken, that's a roommate that's really upset by all this, as you can imagine. It's been nine days since police have been looking for this man. They say the person who knows where he is until he was behind bars lived behind this door. I talked to Pedro Bravo's roommate. This is the door to Pedro Bravo's apartment, locked by police. Eric Skipper doesn't want his face shown, but he was living with Bravo. It's tough to, to really wrap your mind around um, the fact that, that your roommate one day was, you know, just a roommate, and the next day he was allegedly a murderer. Skipper says Bravo was a biomedical engineering major. He was a randomly assigned uh, roommate. Um, good kid, nice kid, quiet kid. Um, he was always friendly to us. He would always offer us, whether, whether he was eating something or doing something. Um, but overall, nice kid. Um, just quiet. Skipper says he and his other roommate never noticed anything out of the ordinary about Bravo, even the night 18-year-old Christian Aguilar disappeared. There wasn't anything that he really did that was suspicious before then. Um, even the night of, because my roommate had witnessed him come up the stairs between 8 and 10 p.m., he came in fast and he left fast, but it wasn't anything unusual for Pedro. Um, he said hello and he said goodbye and that was really it. Skipper doesn't know Aguilar, but hopes the search for him ends soon. I feel uh, terrible for the family. Um, you know, my heart and my prayers go out to them. I hope they find Christian. I really do. Um, because it is, it's just been so sad. It wasn't long before a journal of Pedro's obsession for Erica was uncovered. Okay, enough of that. Moving on. The journal had entries that began immediately after the breakup and continued up until the night before Christian went missing. These entries seemed harmless at first, but became increasingly more violent as the days went on. The entries seemed to indicate the moment that Pedro found out about Erica and Christian, which was almost immediately after they started dating. Long story short, Pedro took note of his desire for revenge. He knew what he wanted to do and he brainstormed a plan to do so. If Pedro was going to lose the love of his life, he was going to do so under his own terms. The journal wasn't the only new piece of evidence pointing towards Pedro. During the continued investigation of Pedro's belongings, investigators located some receipts which connected Pedro to the purchase of duct tape and the shovel found earlier. These purchases were made within the days before Christian's disappearance. They then used these receipts to determine the time and location of each purchase and managed to retrieve the surveillance video of Pedro making each purchase. Investigators also discovered a damning list of searches completed by Pedro. Some of these searches include how many sleeping pills is too many, how to make chloroform, and where is the best place to hide my roommate. Pedro Bravo was then formally charged with the first-degree murder of Christian Aguilar. What we've um, found out, we've gotten the latest information now from the authorities in Gainesville, and we now know Pedro Bravo, who had been picked up as a person of interest in the case of missing freshman Christian Aguilar, well, Bravo has now been charged with murder. Uh, there is no body, though, that has been found so far. Police were frustrated when they were discussing this at the news conference. They're asking the people in the Gainesville area to point out anything that might be suspicious to them that might point them in the direction of a body, possibly, of Christian Aguilar. They're asking people to uh, point out if they've seen any overturned dirt, anything that looks like it could have been buried, that sort of thing, in hopes of finding this 18-year-old's body. But again, murder charges now being filed against Pedro Bravo in the case of this missing young man from the University of Florida. 
during the first week of October 2012, 22 days after Christian Aguilar went missing. His body was finally discovered. It was found partially buried in the middle of a forested area along State Road 24 in Levy County. Gainesville police reported that dental records were used to positively identify his remains. After an autopsy was completed, it was determined that Christian's cause of death was strangulation after being drugged with a high dose of sleep medication. And two years after the charges were placed against Pedro, his trial began in August of 2014. Pedro stuck to a plea of not guilty. One of the most damning testimonies that took place during Pedro's trial was that of Michelangelo, another inmate that Pedro shared a cell with for a short time while behind bars. Shuffling through the courtroom in an unmistakable prison uniform, Michelangelo, a nine-time convicted felon and former gang member, speaks about the days he shared a cell with Pedro Bravo. Did he ever discuss with you whether or not he made a plan about killing Chris? Yes, sir. Uh, I think originally he said that he was going to try to poison him with a, a mixture of sleeping pills and pesticide and mixed with soda or something like yeah, I guess soda and uh, his backup plan was to uh, have a knife you know to cut his throat in case it didn't work. Blood was found in Bravo's SUV where prosecutors believe he was strangled to death all in a Walmart parking lot where Bravo was seen on video buying a shovel. You know after he had got back in the driver's seat and he was you know I guess riding around to dispose of the body that it was making a sound like Ugh! And that, that's the reason that he held on to the driving strap while he was riding around because it freaked him out. Although testimony from other inmates is generally taken with a grain of salt due to their credibility being under question, this testimony in particular seemed to hold some merit as many of the details provided accurately matched the evidence being used against Pedro. One of the more emotional testimonies came from that of the third point to this triangle, Pedro's ex-girlfriend, Erica Freeman. Erica's testimony confirmed the timeline of events as provided at the beginning of this video. She also confirmed that she had been afraid of telling Pedro about the relationship with Christian, as she was very concerned what he might do. At this point, is he telling you he believes you and Christian are dating? Well, he asked me and I told him that we're not, so I, I lied to him saying that we were not dating. I didn't think he was ready to hear that at that time. He wasn't happy about meeting up with Pedro. He was a little, I mean, he didn't really want to, want to um, but we weren't really that concerned they were going to meet in a public place, you know, if anything was going to happen, it wasn't, you know, he might try to punch him or something, and I mean, Christian wouldn't fight, you know, he was, he's not much of a fighter, so he would kind of just walk away. Well, pretty much all the friends that I had in Gainesville, I had been asking them, you know, have you seen Christian around campus? Have you seen Christian? Have you heard from him? Um, later thought and I knew he was going to meet with Pedro so I started calling Pedro. Then, in an unexpected and unusual decision by the defense, Pedro took the stand. Why did you apply to Santa Fe Community College? Because I, I couldn't get to UF and I wasn't just going to go to Gainesville and not continue my education. It was part of, part of what I was agreeing to, to do with my parents to tell them if I'm going to go to Gainesville, all right, I'm still going to continue going to college, you don't have to freak out, I'm not going to you know, not continue doing what I was doing in high school. I'm going to go take classes, and I'm going to try my best to then get the courses that I need so I can transfer over to UF or perhaps even a better university after that. When did you apply and register to Santa Fe? I'm not exactly sure, but I was pretty, I'm think, I think it was like a few days, like two or three days before classes began. At some point, did you make an effort to connect with Erica? I made an effort to connect with Erica around, I'm not, I'm not sure the, say, the, the later date, but it was not at the beginning, it was much later on. Did you make an effort to meet up with Christian? Yes, I made an effort to try and meet up with Christian because even though I was in Gainesville, I was still going through, first I was going through the emotional thing with Erica, and after that I was also going through all my little Bitty bitty problems that just kept mounting up, and he was one of the people I knew I could talk to, and he was the only person in Gainesville that I knew I could relate to me and could help me out. What's the Erica thing, if you could describe to the jury, the thing you're going through with Erica? Tell the jury what that is. Well, 
Erica went to Gainesville, and I, I, I still loved her. My, I was still very enamored with her, and I really wanted to get back with her. So I, other than getting my classes done, I also had a set idea that I'm going to go get her back. And I, I, I'd try to convince myself. I'd keep telling myself, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And the, most of the time, I just can't, couldn't keep bottling up emotion in my head. I'd write, write it down in my journal, and I'd write down how I wanted to get back where how I felt sorry for what I did, how I, I thought I could fix things. And eventually I made it to Gainesville, and uh, it's, a, it's a whole new, different world. While we're on the subject of your journal and sketchbook, uh, did, are those your writings? Those are my handwritings, yes. You're not disputing those? No. Uh, <coughs> so you did you attempt to talk to Christian also about this situation? Uh Christian was in Miami earlier, and he, he I talked to him. I told him that I, I think I'm going to go to Gainesville around September, and I think I'm going to go try and find Erica again. And he told me, he told me, well, at least you should try it, I guess. It's, if she was your love and you think you can do this, go ahead and do it. I told Chris that I want to try and get back with Erica, and I told him, uh, I just, it just makes me feel terrible. I she hasn't told me yes or no. I just wanted a definite answer of, like, yes. There might be a chance we can get together, or no, there's no possible way that we can get back together. Okay. Was this through a telephone conversation, email, or text messages? It was through text message. I turn around and I hit him in the nose with my left fist. Christian is like in the back of the seat, back of the car, and he, he's he's not happy. Obviously, he's mad at me. And now I just hit him in the, in the face, in the nose, and everything. It's adding on to whatever happened to him. Did he sustain any injury when you hit him in the nose? He, his nose started bleeding, yes. The only thing I remember seeing was Christian on the ground and then me leaving. What is Chris's condition when you leave? From what I remember, I can't, I can't give an accurate statement because I'm, I'm not a doctor or anything like that. So I can't tell you if he was... If he was unconscious or he was um, knocked out, but all I, I could tell was that he didn't get up right away, but that he was still moving. Still breathing. Yes. And moving. Yes. When you did this, did you have any malicious intent to kill Christian Aguilar? No, it was all spur of the moment. Come to regret that decision. I feel like I'm gonna regret that decision for the rest of my life. Pedro's defense was very simple. Any of the evidence indicating that he was involved in the murder of Christian was simply false. Any sleeping medication found in his belongings was meant for himself. The vomit in his vehicle could be explained by the fact that Pedro and Christian were friends and had hung out on previous occasions, where Christian may have gotten sick. The blood was from the night that he went missing. However, Christian was absolutely still alive when he removed him from the vehicle. His move to Gainesville and choice of schooling was simply a common choice for young adults that had just graduated high school in Miami. So basically, his defense was, nope, you got it all wrong. Pedro's trial concluded, and after several hours of deliberation, Pedro Bravo was convicted on all seven counts. First degree murder, kidnapping, poisoning, tampering with physical evidence, giving false information, providing false info during an investigation, and improper transportation of human remains. On August 15th, 2014, Pedro Bravo was sentenced to life in prison.